Namaste, and welcome to the Temple of Kriya Yoga's Noon Meditation. Today we're going to talk about your inward adventure. It's the perfect time to take an inward adventure because winter is coming here in the Northern Hemisphere with its shorter days and long quiet times of darkness. It's, a, it's sort of a natural time to turn inward. The trees draw in their life force. Bears and other animals hibernate. Personally, I've been hibernating in my house for months. <laughs> and most often we talk about turning inward as meditation. But today I'm going to talk about the practice of, practice of quietly contemplating the wisdom of the ancient sages as we take our adventure inward. And after that, I'll add a few thoughts about the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that's coming up next week. But let's start with a mantra. We'll start with some chanting. The mantra today is Om Ganesha Ganapati Om. Ganesha is often viewed as the god of knowledge and wisdom, and sometimes he's seen as the consort of booty, of wisdom and knowledge, the goddess of wisdom and knowledge. And so Ganesh is the lover of wisdom and knowledge. So we're calling on Ganesh. And this is one of the ways that we embody the divine principle. We aren't simply existing, we're seekers, we're always searching for knowledge of wisdom, we're always learning. And Tomorrow, there's going to be a solar eclipse in the sign of Sagittarius. And that sign also symbolizes wisdom and learning, learning and teaching, and a sign that energizes us, both our enthusiasm for learning, and it also energizes our sense of adventure. So let's chant this mantra and, and get the blessing of Ganesh. Ganesha is also blesses new beginnings, and we always have that at the new moon, which is tomorrow's eclipse is a new moon, and also the upcoming winter solstice next week. So let's chant for blessings for our new beginning and for the seeking of wisdom and knowledge. <laughs>
quietly for another minute or two will you absorb and internalize the sound of the mantra Sri Ganesha, bless our new beginnings in our inward adventure. Bless us with knowledge and wisdom, and most of all, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. So on our adventure inward, we have some important companions books that contain the teachings of the wise souls of the past. Now back in, uh, when I was in the seminary back in the um, mid 1970s, Kriyananda gave us four books to read that he said, read these 12 times. So these were important books. They weren't the only books that we read in the seminary and they weren't the only books that have wonderful teachings in them. But I'm gonna talk about these four books today. And the four books are Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, and that's compiled by Paul Raps, the Bhagavad Gita, the Dhammapada, and the Tao Te Ching. And there's many different translations of these books and many different ways to interpret them. So I'm going to give you just like my a, t a taste, like taste of Chicago. This is going to be taste of spiritual scripture, taste of books of wisdom, with just, just from the very beginning of those books. And hopefully the taste of those books 
will make you hungry for more of those books of wisdom. I'm going to start with I'm going to start with a cup of tea. And this is the very first story in the book Zen Flesh Zen Bones. Nan In was a Japanese master. And one day Nan In received a university professor who came to inquire about Zen. Nan In served tea. He poured his visitor's cup full and then kept pouring. And the professor watched the overflow until he could no longer restrain himself and said, it's over full, no more will go in. Like this cup, Nanin said, you are full of your own opinions and speculations. How can I show you Zen unless you first empty your cup? So what we're gonna do is take a minute to reflect on this to think the story through in your mind. Did the story give you any insights? A cup of tea is the first story in this book of Zen stories and Zen koans. Can you think why that is? The first step on your inward adventure is to let go of what you think you know. In meditation practice, you sometimes hear someone say, empty your mind, but that's hard. It's, hard. it's really hard. It's hard to empty your mind. But how about what if we let go of the attachment to all the thoughts and opinions and things we've learned in the past. Come fresh to these books. Come fresh to your meditation and contemplation. The, the point for all these books and for any spiritual or any books that you read is to read a little bit and think about it. And when we say think about it in yoga, we're really saying, you know, close your eyes. Think about what you've just heard or what you've just read. And speaking of what you just heard, I just want to say, you don't have to read the books. You could also, there's also now audio books. So you may be hearing them. Just be open, open your mind and open your mind and relate, if you can, what you've heard to your life today. A really important book for yogis and spiritual seekers is the Bhagavad Gita. It's a scripture that's filled with wonderful yoga philosophy. But interestingly enough, this book that helps us to find inner peace takes place on a battlefield. And right in the beginning, the battle pauses as Lord Krishna talks to the warrior Arjuna. But first, the very first sentence or shloka is on the field of duty, on the field of heart's desire. That's from Kriyananda's translation. But it's Dharma Kshetra Kuru Kshetra. Dharma is duty. Dharma is not just duty. Dharma is the eternal law of life, the eternal laws, the uh, the the highest, the highest truth. So some people say on the field of truth, on the field of heart's desire. And this is, this is where we're at every day. So we say very often here at the temple, your everyday life is your spiritual life. And that's because every day we're confronted, not necessarily by gigantic drama or gigantic problems. Sometimes we are. Sometimes we're in the midst of some very tough problems. But most of the time of the day, it's us and what's going on in our head and us and what's going on with our emotions. So in everyday life, we're on, 
you don't have to think of it as a battlefield, but it is a battlefield because we emotions arise. Um, it's up and down, up and down, up and down, sometimes calm, sometimes not calm, but we have angers and resentments and frustrations and fears that, that we confront every day. And so we're on this, we, if we are working on ourselves, we're definitely on this battlefield because um, something, something will arise. Somebody says something, your spouse, your friend, your boss, your coworker, somebody says something to you and it makes you angry. And then what do you do? Okay, so yeah, here's what you do. You, you observe, go like, oh, isn't that interesting? This anger has arisen. And then you think about, that's really interesting. It arises. It can, I'm always angry when this person says this thing to me. Why do they keep saying it? And then you have to say, well, why do I keep getting angry at myself? I'm angry at them and then at myself for being angry because I'm supposed to be a yogi. And then, of course, I should never get angry. And so this is our, this is almost like our yoga workplace more than a battlefield. It's like, oh, okay, here's that emotion again. What do I do with it? And I think just the recognition of it, it can be very helpful. But this is, this is where we are. We, it, it really helps if you can work on the little things. This is my theory of the everyday life is the spiritual life. It's the little tiny things because they build and build and build and they build patterns in us. And anytime we can break those patterns, partly by self-awareness, by just going like, oh, there it is again. And then, oh, I have a choice. I can choose. I can choose to be fearful or I can choose to let go of that fear. I can choose to be frustrated or I can just go, I can say a little prayer. I can say, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Or I can just go like, I'm, I'm letting that go. I'm going to let that go right now because I'd rather be peaceful. And it's, this is our challenge. So we're almost like warriors on the battlefield, but maybe it's not, like I said, a battlefield. Maybe it's just a workplace. Where you go like, oh, here's the task in front of me. It's to be peaceful right now. How do I be peaceful if I got jaw jangled up from something somebody said or something I saw on TV or something um, I read in the newspaper or I stubbed my toe and ouch, it hurts. This is our, this is our everyday life. Uh, so work on the small things of everyday life. Apply the yamas and the yamas. Apply the things that we learn in yoga Nonviolence, our, our desire to be nonviolent as yogis, our our work, our practice of nonviolence. So we apply what we know about nonviolence, and we we know that it's not just punching people, that, that kind of violence, but it's what we say to ourselves, what we say to other people, what we think in our heads, and to go to more towards the santosha, the contentment. All these things, um, if you want to read more deeply and how to look at the yamas and the yamas, the um, practices, the observances, the, the things that we don't, would be best if we didn't do, the things that <clears throat> we should apply to our life that we should do. That's really all in Kriyananda's Spiritual Science of Kriya Yoga. But think about, let's, let's close our eyes for a mom moment and think Dharma Kshetra Ku Kshetra, the battlefield of duty, the battlefield of heart's desire, what battles are we fighting? I mean, just even since the time you woke up this morning, what battles have you fought? And how, how would you like to do things differently? Let's take a quiet moment and contemplate that.
So that's just a taste of the Bhagavad Gita. It's a wonderful, wonderful book of wisdom. And I think if you look at the temple's website, that uh, we have some wonderful videos uh, by Gary Whitney, where he reads his riffs on the Bhagavad Gita, which is also a wonderful, wonderful book. And let's talk about the Dhammapada. The Dhammapada is a Buddhist book of wisdom. It's the Buddha, the Buddha's teachings as written in the Pali language. These, this is a book that's extremely uh, popular in the, for, in the Buddhist tradition, in the Southeast Asian Buddhist tradition. And it's really, this, or this is the very first two lines, or the very first two shlokas, the very first two uh, sections of this wonderful, wonderful book on the Buddhist teachings. And it's so important. So this is a Dhammapada as translated from the Pali by Juan Mascaro. And it says, the very first line says, what we are today comes from our thoughts of yesterday and our present thoughts build on our life of tomorrow. Our life is the creation of our mind. If a man speaks or acts with an impure mind, suffering follows him as the wheel of the cart follows the beast that draws the cart. That's the first section. Here comes the section two. What we are today comes from our thoughts of yesterday and our present thoughts build our life of tomorrow. Our life is the creation of our mind. If a man speaks or acts with a pure mind, joy follows him as his own shadow. So let's take a minute to contemplate that. What we are today comes from the thoughts of yesterday and our present thoughts build our life of tomorrow. Think about what are your thoughts today? What are you creating tomorrow? And this is the nature of karma. This is how we talk about karma at the temple. That we are the creative principle, aham brahmasmi. This is the nature of karma. This is how we talk about karma here at the temple. Aham brahmasmi, we are the creative principle. We are always creating. And so often we say, the life that you're living today is what you've created from the past, not just necessarily this lifetime, but most likely many lifetimes the past. It's a momentum. It's, it's a creation. It's a force. And I know a lot of people don't like to think about how powerful they are and what they've created. But here you are today. The good news is that starting right now, this moment, you are creating your future life. What do you want to create? How can you make that creation happen? What you think, what you do, what you say, all of these things create momentum for the future. Put your energy into what you want to create and how you want your life to be. If you want peace, be peaceful. If you want beauty, surround yourself with beauty. If you want love, be a loving person. I'm not the first person to say this. I'm sure you've heard this before, but it's so important. And it's, it's 
not just something that um, we were saying in the 20th century, it's something that was said thousands of years ago. So that's the teaching of the very first beginning. The whole book is good, but it's just the very first couple of slokas of the Dhammapada. It's like uh, the, it, in Sanskrit, it would be the Dharma Padma, the, at the feet of the teachings, at the feet of the, the law. Here we are sitting at the feet of these wise souls across centuries that have given us these teachings. And last, I'm gonna talk about the Tao Te Ching. And again, just the first line because it's so fascinating and interesting to think about an important point. And so the very first, the Tao Te Ching is uh, a Chinese book of wisdom. It is said it was written by Lao Tzu, the old master. Uh, and Lao Tzu um, wrote a whole book of these aphorisms or these almost like poems, these sayings and these teachings. And it takes some time to get into, but the very first line is, there are ways, but the way is uncharted. So sometimes people say, the way that can be spoken of is not the way, it's not the true way. Or the Tao that can be told is not the eternal and unchanging Tao. So the, the way, we, we can teach a lot of different ways but your path or the true path or the reality is you is can't be spoken of. I, I'd like you to just take a moment to think about your path and that there's many paths to truth. There's many paths to enlightenment. There's many ways to to to, to follow the teachings. Just quietly sit and think about there are ways, but the way is uncharted, unwritten, cannot be spoken of. And so you've just touched the very beginning, the very beginning of all these books. Read more if you like. These, these books aren't the only books, but they are considered very fine books of wisdom, very recommended. There are many other recommended books. I think when, when, you, when you start as a spiritual seeker, something interesting happens. Uh, one book will present another book to you. Uh, a, per, a friend recommends a book that's life-changing. When you're ready to change your life, when you're ready to seek, books fall off the shelf at you. They, they jump off the shelf. Maybe not literally, sometimes literally, but not always. But one, one good book leads itself to another. You go like, oh, this is so interesting. I wonder if there's any more like these. And you have to find things that speak to you. But at the same time, if a book is recommended, 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 like this is a classic of something, you know, it's, it's well worth your time to read some of it and slowly read it and slowly 
like every day read a little bit and 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 work with it and think about it and at, see if it applies to your life and see if it's something that is helpful to you. So find the ones that speak to you. On your path, most likely you're going to find books, but you're also going to find tapes or recordings, as we say today, uh, CDs, podcasts, YouTube videos. You'll find them like old treasures along the road. You go like, oh, look at this. And, you know, you pick it up or you open it up or you push the button that says start. And um, the, the this wisdom comes to you. This teaching comes to you. It's not hidden. In the olden days, there was so much teaching that used to be hidden or not published or not translated into English or whatever language you speak. It's, a, it's treasures along the path. The practice of contemplation of these books, like I said, just means reading a little bit, thinking about it, seeing if it applies to your life, seeing if you get your own insights, Give yourself time to let them unfold for you slowly. Astrology is a type of book, whether you know it or not. You know, I'm making a little bit of a segue into the astrological portion of what I want to talk about today. And but when you have a horoscope in front of you, or when you look at the patterns of the stars and the planets in the sky, you read it, and it's just like reading a book. It gives you information, it tells you things, it tells you about cycles and patterns and placements and possibilities. So I just want to take a, a couple of minutes to talk about, I, I already mentioned the, the solar eclipse that's happening tomorrow. It's at 10, 16 a.m., 23 degrees Sagittarius. And like I said, it energizes our enthusiasm for learning, our sense of adventure. I think it, and, and <clears throat> a solar eclipse is always a new moon. And a new moon is a time of new beginning for the month, but a solar eclipse is a point of new beginning for the year. So think, contemplate, create what you want to learn, especially because Sagittarius is a sign of learning. What do you want to learn in 2021? What do you want to learn? What um, book do you want to read? What do you want to learn more about? Is there a language you want to learn? Is there someplace you want, you want to travel to when we can, you know, oh, and travel opens up? We can, um, or where would you like to travel to in your mind? Whatever type of travel you want to take. But think about or make a commitment on the, the solar, this solar eclipse of what new thing do you want to learn or what thing that you already know would you like to expand your learning. But even more importantly, uh, then the solar eclipse, there's a Saturn-Jupiter conjunction next week on December 21st. It's at zero degrees Aquarius for those of you who want to put that into your charts or think about where that falls in your own horoscope. The reason the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction is important more than just a planetary conjunction is because it's a 20-year cycle. It happens approximately every 20 years. And so when we talk about points of new beginning, then you say, okay, well, a new Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, a new cycle, a new Jupiter and Saturn cycle happen at this point. And you have to think about your longer term plans. You have to think about um, your goals, your long term goals, your long term um, where, where you want to go with your life. So it doesn't have to be career goals. It doesn't have to be spiritual goals. I always think it's good to have like an overarching goal, like to seek wisdom, to find peace, to find love and harmony, whatever your 
whatever words you like to use for that. But you may also have other types of life goals, and you may want to affirm them at the Saturn and Jupiter conjunction around the 21st. It's called the Great Conjunction because it's supposed to symbolize some sort of change in our society or our evolution as humans, but you want to think about it more as your own personal evolution. So let me let me back up and give you a few key words for Jupiter and for Saturn, because most people think Jupiter, because it's a happy planet, is good, and Saturn, because it's a serious planet, is bad. But there's no, in astrology, there's no good or bad planets. Jupiter, it's, it's the urge of each planet expressing itself, and they're, they're together expressing their planetary urge together at the same time. So Jupiter is a, is a planet that symbolizes expansion and growth and opportunity. And Saturn is limitation and constraint and loss, and that's why people don't like it. But it's but limitation can be good. We're all we're all limited in in some way. We're limited by um, in our body. Uh, our skin holds us is, is ruled by skin is ruled by Saturn. It holds us together. So we're limited. Um, so we're not like um, so the insides of our body aren't all over the place. They're they're limited. They're held in. It's like a security. Uh, it's a structure. So Saturn is structure, it's foundation and structure. And Jupiter, which is such a happy planet, is always asking for more. So it can be excessiveness, it can be greediness. Give me more of that. Oh, I've got some, but I want more and more and more. So Jupiter can be um, either wonderfully expanding and positive and optimism, but it can also be some sort of out of, a little bit out of control. And Saturn is good because it can be concentration and self-discipline. And Jupiter can be good because the the optimism can say good things to people, like praise, and Saturn can be a critique. So it's really important when you know that there's Saturn happening, like the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, that that you don't um, squash the dream of another person. They're so much tendency in us to say that that negative, or maybe we think very helpful, practical thing to somebody that may squash their dreams. So because Jupiter is that bubbly optimism and sometimes doesn't um, sometimes doesn't see how to get from the the feeling of the dream to the uh, execution of the dream, to the, the final goal of the dream. But Saturn is the planet or the urge or the, the, the skill within us that says, well, if you want to get from here to there, here's your first step. And let's make a project plan. And then we can do one step at a time. And they're small steps, but they build on each other and we get to the end. And that, those are the type of things. Well, this is the, um, this is the Dharma Kshetra, Kuru Kshetra, right? It's the battlefield of between the optimism and the practicality. It's the, a battle between growth and limitation. So, uh, but, but when Jupiter and Saturn work well together, you can make big plans. Like I said, you can make big plans because Jupiter can look at the big vision and Saturn can make the practical plans. Jupiter and Saturn working together can be like a sustained effort. Jupiter is the inspiration and Saturn is the sustainment, the sustaining of the, of the effort to succeed. Slow but steady growth. These are, this, is, this is Saturn and Jupiter working together. But how do, you, how do you enliven this aspect? How do you make it work for you? How do, remember with the Dhammapada says, what are your thoughts? about Saturn and Jupiter. So it's important to, because our thoughts are creative, it's important to think about what Saturn and Jupiter means. What what are we expanding? What do we have that urge to expand in our life? What what, What is that critiquing voice in our head saying? 
And why is it saying that? But some ways to, to balance that out. One of the best ways to balance out the Jupiter and Saturn as we're going through this week, or even going through the next 20 years, is to be great, grateful, is to have an attitude of gratitude, and seriously to sit down and e either a little bit every day, or you can make a big gratitude list. What are the things you're grateful for in your life? And when you confront your limitations, say what you're grateful for. When you are thinking about more, what you want more, more money, more uh, a bigger house, bigger everything, just think about what you're grateful for in your life for what you have right now. Doesn't mean that's all you have to have, but to be grateful for it, to be grateful for the love and the peace and the happiness that you have, love for whatever security you have, the little things that you have. If you have, if you have um, um, any abundance affirmations, it would be good to say them at the time. Like, I am open and receptive to all the good and abundance in the universe. Something like that. But there's many of them. You can look for them online and find abundance affirmation that speaks to you. And that could be something good if you want to put a creative thought in your head. Affirmations are creative thoughts. They're creating your future. It's what you want for your future. And if you get stuck and you're not really grateful <laughs> and you're not, um, you're not one of the person who likes positive affirmations, watch your breath. Do a breathing exercise. There's very simple breathing exercises that can be really helpful at the Saturn Jupiter conjunction because. When you breathe in, you're expanding. You're expanding your lungs. When you breathe out, you're contracting your lungs. This is a very natural, positive thing that happens. It's life. For us as humans, the in-breath and the out-breath is life. And so uh, let's just try. Just close your eyes and slowly breathe in to a count of six or eight or 10 or 12, whatever you, whatever you like. But just you breathe into a count and then you make your breath equal breathing out to that count. And let's just do that for a minute or two. This is one of the easy ways to relax, to find peace, and also to be so aware of, of how opposites, like Jupiter and Saturn, are opposites like breathing in and breathing out, they build and sustain our life. So watch your, watch your thoughts as you go through the week. Um, watch your thoughts, especially the ones that have any emotionality attached, what you say to yourself, what you speak out loud, and try to see, are these words of expansion or are they words of limitation? May you be blessed with the abundance of Jupiter and the security of Saturn. And we'll close with Kriyananda's blessing prayer for us. 
May the infinite Lord of life, of love and laughter bless you at this moment. May each cell of your being and every petal of your mind be touched, be healed and be harmonized. May vim and vigor and vitality be yours. May love and laughter be yours. May you find truly that which you seek and may you find that which you seek swiftly, surely, and most, most harmoniously. Let's close with the Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti mantra. Oh, Shanti. Shanti, Shanti, Thank you so much for being here with us today. Namaste.